building of Kulmanti project. I speak, the distinguished speaker for this evening, Kanak and it needs no introduction. He is a journalist, writer, and civil activist. He is the founding editor of Himal South Asian Region Review magazine and publisher of the Nepalese language weekly Himal Khabar Patrika, which is really famous in our country, a popular. Uh, he has a degree in law from Delhi University and an international relations and journalism from uh, Columbia University. Uh, Mr. Dixit worked in United Nations Secretariat between 1982 to 1990. Uh, he is linked with uh, many other uh, fields uh, apart from journalism. Uh, he's linked with a uh, film South Asia Festival. Uh, he is also the honorary chairman of Kathmandu Valley Preservation Trust, which looks after the preserving uh, our ancient uh, heritage sites like Kathmandu Square, Kathmandu Square, and Kathmandu Square. He is also involved in Saza Yataya. Uh, he is a children author, and uh, he has also worked as a translator for uh, our distinguished uh, politician Svipi Koirala. He's the writer of two books, uh, The Country I See and Peace Politics of Nepal. He is one of the most respected intellectuals of our country, Nepal. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Dixon. Milk here at the back. Uh, I might need to reach out loud. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. No. <laughs> the lectern. You, you can't hear it back. Okay. The microphone's off. catches the tragedy that Nepal underwent and continues to undergo actually throughout the month of April 2015 with an illustration, a photograph by <coughs> Dipendra Bhajacharya. Some of you may have seen it and uh, I prefer to describe it to you than show it to you on any screen. Um, it is an image of a block of stone, carved stone, about three feet in diameter and three feet in height, fallen on the ground and underneath from it is a grasping hand in bronze. It is the hand of Pratap Manga. It is the, the statue of Pratap Manga, the great king, 17th century king of, uh, of Kathmandu town, Kathmandu city state, uh, which fell from its pedestal to the ground and the entire statue itself is crushed but from underneath comes a hand. And the hand, meant to be so high up, high up, not to be seen by anyone, is exquisitely carved. It's in bronze, but it's lifelike. At one go, it gives you a sense of what our people suffered in the hills and in the valley. It also tells you a little bit of what our, how our heritage has suffered. And uh, I will talk a little bit about housing a little bit about schooling, something about livelihoods and heritage. Uh, I will probably, there are some among you here who have actually experienced the earthquake uh, in Kathmandu, North Gorkha, a horrific experience by one of our friends in the audience. Mine might be a little stayed in comparison, but only to suggest to you my personal um, uh, countenancing of an earthquake in that it was within Kathmandu Valley it was more of a wave at 
apparent because of the silk on which much of Kathmandu habitations exist. There is more of a waviness to the experience, different from the experience in the rocky outcrops and in the hills. So it was like being on a boat in a very rough sea, going almost up to a minute, uh, but then looking around and seeing that the buildings around you stood and thinking that maybe it's not that bad. So for me it was days of incremental horror because first the neighborhood is fine, secondly the toll next door seems fine and then the word came Dharara has fallen. Didn't believe it actually and uh, then got onto a motorbike with a friend, went off and there Dharara had fallen and that was my first view personally of, of the death that was visited upon the people of Nepal uh, because that was a Saturday. Elsewhere, it being a Saturday was a boom. For Dharara, being a Saturday was a bane, a tragedy. Uh, two two uh, young women who happened to be climbing and gave separate interviews remember something that has stuck to my mind. It is that they said when they got up to the top of Dharara, it, there was a very stiff breeze. And it just, for me personally, it just it gives a geographical and a climactic marker to the earthquake beyond what everybody else knows that there was a stiff breeze that day. And you can see this stiff breeze in all the photographs and all the CCTV videos that you see, which will be analyzed many years from now, continue to be analyzed for what they say of the tragedy that we suffered. But what you do see is buildings crash, monuments crash, the nine-story Basantapur uh, Darbar crashes and the wind sweeps it away, westward. It is the eastern wind. Uh, when you see the videos in the mountainsides, it is like mortar bombardment of the hills because wherever there is a mud mortar house, it collapses and there's a plume of dust that comes out of it. So it's like uh, there is a, a video from a, somebody's video camera, a local <coughs> villager, uh, and it is Jalbire Sindhu Patri. And the camera pans across the mountain sides. And what you think are remnants of monsoon clouds just after a squall are actually dust plumes. And they are all over. It says in one go, it is a document of our demography. What does it say? It says uh, mud mortar. When we should probably have graduated from mud mortar, if only our society were in uh, less of a political chaos, where there was a time to catch your breath and look at your rural architecture, look at your urban architecture, and have some kind of planning that also remains on the ground, uh, that is real on the ground, so that we don't, at the very least, have a situation where boulders are attached to each other by loose, by mud, not even boulders cut to size. And then when the earthquake comes, they all fall into each other. So demographically, that is one thing that we learned. The other is that the scattered nature of the hill, hill spaces. What we know, we've always repeated these things, except now it becomes so real to us. We've repeated the idea that Nepal has the highest concentration of population for any hill society in the world. You get to see that again in that Jalbiri video, where you see people are scattered, but they are all there, all over the hillsides. And you locate them because these are by now wooded hillsides because of community, community forestry that has succeeded. In these wooded hillsides, you see puffs of dust, which indicates high population density but also the scattered nature of the people and the very fact that the people have stayed with mud mortar when the more well-to-do have gone in for cement. I'm not the expert to judge any, uh, matters related to concrete, pillar, beam. Uh, I know that in Kathmandu Valley there were many lives saved this time around also perhaps because it was only a, only quote unquote, a 7.8 Richter and not an 8.2 Richter but the cement buildings stood, so we did not have many more deaths and maimings than we did. But uh, I.
do get a sense that some of our certitudes will have to be adjusted to the realities that we have seen on the ground, such as, oh, don't build roads because they are, they will impact your culture, they will impact your economy in a negative way, perhaps. But the villagers have their own certitudes, they want a road. And this time round, where the road did go, the relief did flow. After a few hiccups, but they did flow. And where the road was impassable, the motorbikes went on along a track that we knew. So, the villagers perhaps know some things that we city folks are, uh, would ask them to consider and reconsider. So, when I talked about the incremental horror, that is from Patan Dhoka to Dharara, Dharara to Beer Hospital. And then the news starts coming in from the outlying places. And it comes for a week or two. When the, the word came that Langtang had seen uh, hundreds of dead, it was hard to believe because I personally did not know that Langtang had started seeing so many tourists. And it could be that Langtang was seeing tourists because it is one of the few touristic destinations where now roads don't go past the trekking trail. So unbeknownst, at least to me, there were hundreds of people in Langtang village when it was wiped out. We yet don't know how many, but we know that it is in the hundreds. The fact that it was an earthquake on a Saturday, you will have discussed this with, among yourself. Many of you Nepali friends from Nepal would have told you this. But that yes, because it was a Saturday, because it was near to noon, uh, the morning meal was over, the gas stove or the stove was turned off. Uh, it was. I recall a slightly chilly morning. So many people who otherwise would have stayed indoors were outdoors. So that saved many, many people. The fact that it was Saturday, the schools came down in large parts, but the children were not in the schools. But an example would be that there was one school where there was a training being held uh, in Gorkha, and four teachers died within that school to pieces. So there are indications that there would have been many, many more deaths of children. Even then, the demography of the death itself is interesting and sad. What do we find? 30, I could, I would not, I may get the number wrong by a person or two, but 37 percent of the adults who died were women. Oh, I'm sorry, among those that died, 8,000 8, count and there will be more. 37% women, 30% men. That will ask us to question why. We might get into that if there are some question answers, time for question answers. Uh, if I remember correctly, 17% girl children and 15% boy children. And 17%, 37% women, adult, and 30% men. Partly, this is the excruciating factor and the incremental horror of it all to think of the fact that the men folk are in India, in the Gulf, in Malaysia, elsewhere. Not there the bodies, uh, the, the, the hands to dig bodies out of the rubble immediately to save lives. Then not enough hands to carry the bodies to the river and not enough hands to cut the firewood to bring it to the cremation fire. Uh, the, the, the sense of terror, and from what I gather, some of it continues in, in the furthest, most reaches of the deep Himalayan valleys, where some in, large, in many places the bodies are still under the rubble. Because these are scattered settlements, and not everybody has got everywhere, uh, even without considering the inefficiencies of the, of the government. And then also to consider the sense of sheer panic of those who are overseas, working in the Gulf and in Malaysia. I think cumulatively we got a horrendous situation. This was a, as I have written, a class conscious earthquake in that it impacted all, all um, 
natural disasters tend to impact uh, the poor disproportionately. In the case of Nepal, the very fact that the directionality, the depth, and the intensity, and the, de uh, and the time, um, the length of the earthquake seem to, seem to, I'm not a seismologist, I'm not an expert, seem to affect mud mortar buildings. As if the, the earthquake would just not let go until the building came down. And this is what happened. My brother was on the Champadevi hill coming down and suddenly the earth shook. And as you may know, Nepal has, Kathmandu Valley has moved about three meters southward and a meter or so upward. So, to, so much so that the pilots themselves will have to recalibrate Kathmandu airports, uh, mean sea level. Um, but my brother looking down sees balls of smoke uh, rising from Bhaktapur inner city, Dalitpur inner city, Kathmandu inner city, Saku in the far side, Kokana nearby, Bungamati nearby, all of them mud mortar buildings. All of them where in many places the city well to do have already moved to outside city limits to live in bungalow style housing. And these are places that are given over to rentals, uh, sometimes to people from the hills, sometimes to people from the plains. Not in all places, but in some of the inner cities, pertinent uh, areas of Patan and Kathmandu. So, a class conscious earthquake, which also means that this should alert us to the kind of response we should have, uh, in given the kind of people that were victimized, because their support mechanisms will be very poor. I myself am involved with the Spinal Injury Rehabilitation Center, and the 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 saying we have always gone by to try to motivate, motivate ourselves in pre-earthquake times is the poorer you are, the harder you fall. And it seems to me that uh, the poorer you are, also the more the houses will fall on you. And this is what we have to keep in mind and I can only give you my experience with the spinal injured because that's when the long-term paralysis and impact of paralysis of various parts, depending on where you got injured, uh, that long-term impact, the, the economic impact on the family, the emotional impact on the family, and the, and the survivor, the victim. Um, I get, a, therefore, a, a ringside seat at the Spinal Injury Rehab Center in Sangha, near Bonipa, to see what happens to the villagers, what kind of shock uh, they are coming through as they come through because uh, it's uh, the hospitals are still going through their their roster and the patients that they kept aside to operate on later are now being operated and they are coming in and uh, 35 patients is our average load three patients three months is the average time a patient stays with us and we are preparing we already are more than double that uh, we are about to to about uh, eight, 90 or so patients, and we expect there to be 200 patients in the initial rush. Um, what kind of patients? Patients who live in mud mortar buildings by and large, either in the city or in the villages. So, since we have talked a little bit about the houses that came down, we need to talk briefly about the housing that we need to think, consider. The first month, of course, was spent thinking and planning on the tops and you will all have followed the great Tarpalin saga over the last, last month. I won't go more into that. But slowly the realization coming that what you need is uh, shelter to get you through the monsoon and the winter at one go, while then you plan for the long-term housing. Um, so. I think we're just about getting to talk about it and while we have been thinking about it, I'll talk about the new spirit of volunteerism that has suddenly become evident, um, come to that in a while. But while the rest of us were talking, the further you were from the road end, the more if the people had hands, they were already adjusting to the reality to try to survive, to try to survive there and there. So, if the house had fallen and the tin fell without being um, 
damage, then you brought down the top floor, brought the tin down and created uh, space to get through the winter. Where the tin uh, or the, the corrugated iron the sheets were just unusable, that was a different matter. In the longer term, what we have, and of course there's a lot of talk now about prefab and people have come up with new ideas for temporary housing and all of that is welcome because Nepal is such a variegated land that you can't have anything regimented. And we have to make sure that there is no regimentation by the government or by non-profit organizations or by international organizations because every place, not just by altitude, but also by, uh, by its uh, orientation, by the culture, by the ethnicity, there will be so many ways to do it. And I think it will pass, but for a while there has been some talk that reminds one of socialist architecture and grid line patterns and row houses, etc. Some places that may be useful. Some places it may be important to re relocate settlements because they are just so dangerous. But other places it will be easier said than done because you also our experiences with floods and other landslides, if you make what you think is a nice enough house, but if it is away from your field, what good is it to the villager? And if you do not have alternative livelihoods to offer, then what good is a nice looking prefab house in the middle of a colony if your field is two miles away and you do not have a motorbike and it's through mountain terrain. So I think lots of thinking has to be done. It is good that there has been a, f a vibrancy in, uh, in, uh, in Kathmandu and in Nepal as a whole right now. But I would hope that this vibrancy continues. And the place, this is something I wanted to say towards the end, but let me say it right now because I, I, I remember so that I don't forget it later. I think the thing for friends, for Nepalis and friends of Nepal and who I call Occidental Nepalis, people who are Nepali at heart, they may not have the citizenship, the Occidental Nepalis and the Nepalis, what they need to do is keep watch on Nepal and the needs of the people of Nepal, particularly the weakest demographic category, when the interest of the media and the interest of the donor organizations, and even the rescue and relief organizations, when they begin to wane is when those who feel, oh, but I have not been able to do much. I think there are enough people on the ground concerned. But probably where we need to do now is to think of the, let's not say the long haul, but the medium haul. And that is where I feel there is a need for us to ensure that the whole focus of housing, schooling, and livelihoods, and heritage. We don't miss out on any of those. Um, in housing, I will just say this much then, that there is, there is uh, the government has been talking about housing policies, about distributing, uh, for now, distributing corrugated iron sheets, etc. These things, I think, will, there are enough, there is enough activism and there is enough media push that willy-nilly will get somewhere. It may not be the most efficient. What we need to con be concerned about is, what kind of permanent housing are we going to talk about? What kind of philosophical changes in our thinking will we need to bring? Indeed, is mud mortar not that good? Or is it just that the mud mortar was applied wrong? Number one. Number two, could it be that if our ancestors had had access to other technology, they may have evolved their own um, building architecture ever so slightly differently? What is it? I think these are the kind of uh, research and activism we need to do. As far as schooling is concerned, um, firstly, I would like to suggest uh, that we all keep a certain sense of perspective. There is great devastation in Nepal, uh, but in terms of most affected districts, we are talking about 14 districts out of 75 districts. Yet, I should tell you, the impact in terms of economic and psychosocial is countrywide. And uh, to illustrate to you how people in far away parts have been impacted, they all seem to think the Western tourists and even the Kathmandu Valley elite don't think that much of the Dragara. But for the parts of Nepal unaffected by the earthquake, the first thing they say is, Dragara Dhaladi. The Dragara has fallen. This is the litany all over. There is something that Dharara 
means for the rural Nepali that someone like me had not appreciated enough. And what could it be? This is for the social scientists in the days ahead to, to study. What is it? Could it be um, a symbol of state, a symbol of stability, a symbol of Kathmandu Valley's exotica, or just the fact that it was a tall building and sometime in your life you've gone up there and looked around. But for some reason, uh, the way it hasn't come out in the media, even in Kathmandu, where we see it as a symbol fallen. But we haven't seen how people from elsewhere have studied and understood Dharara's fall. Uh, because it was, it is seen in a slightly different light, I think, than how the media have projected it till now. In terms of livelihoods, and here I'd like to slip in this idea, that perhaps um, for what tragedy has visited us, um, we, we should try to use it as a wake-up call, most importantly for livelihoods. To begin with, livelihoods have been lost. The economic growth that we had reaching towards 4.55% GDP will probably come down to 3.54. Uh, the 1,300 Nepalis that ride the plane, the flights going to Malaysia and uh, outward migrants, job migrants, 1,300 a day. That, for now, has come down to 1,000 a day. Some people have decided to stay back, um, at least for now, uh, to take care of, uh, of their households and homesteads. But why is it that they are leaving when the country has such possibilities of generating good livelihoods and good income? Unlike so many countries which are poor, Nepal, it remains poor but has possibilities. Why have we not been able to convert those possibilities? I think it's time for us to really get serious, to, uh, to begin to appreciate what Nepal has to offer. And I do not only point the finger at politician, I point the finger at civil society and intelligentsia. I won't go more into that, but only to suggest to you that there is this, it is, the earthquake was not a wake up call. The earthquake was an was a natural event which turned out to be a human catastrophe. But it can be used as a wake up call. Most importantly in terms of livelihoods. So that we try to, from tourism to manufacturing, we try to utilize what our society can deliver, what our, sorry, what our geography and economy and our placement in South Asia can deliver to our people. So I see the livelihood issue beyond the obvious loss of livelihoods in terms of what can we do perhaps for the days ahead. Um, I think I did speak briefly about schooling, but I'd like to say that the challenge of the moment as you and I speak, as the schools open, is one is the psychology of the young ones when there's been such trauma to begin with and then such reported trauma and such fear in in the mind of the parents themselves, that uh, it is an incredible task for a very weakened education system of Nepal to begin with. You, you would probably know that the education system in Nepal is extremely, uh, let's say 80% of the children go to government schools, but the motivation levels in the schools are very, very low. And in this situation, we have visited with an earthquake, schools have been closed for a month, and now the children are about to come back. I feel that that critical moment, how will we tackle it, number one. Number two, again, to use it as a wake-up call, if we are able to really grasp this notion that the children of Nepal are being treated, and hence Nepal's future is being treated by among the worst government school education anyway, and Private school education, by and large, that is not anything to write home about. So, schooling is a place of either the immediate need and the long-term needs. Let me talk briefly about heritage and I'll begin to wind up with certain thematic ideas. In terms of heritage, what is, well, and what you already know of course, is that uh, heritage is, when we say heritage in Nepal, we're talking about living heritage. Living heritage to begin with requires brick and mortar and stone and wood and bronze and tile. A temple is living heritage. 
it needs to be standing for itself, for its pure architectural qualities. But when a temple also provides you, not just with the puja in the sanctum, but provides you with the excuse, if you will, for the jatra, for the mela, for the events in the lunar calendar, that then gives you a living culture that Kakpandu Valley has, which is owned by the entire country. As somebody wrote to me only yesterday, the temples have to be rebuilt, reconsecrated with Chema Puja, to, given, to be given their old bhav and value, uh, not just for the architectural needs, but the soul will go out of, of Nepal. If we cannot rebuild the temples and rebuild them in a way that people will regard them in the same way as they did in the past. Fortunately, and possibly this, some of this credit goes back to the Bhaktipur Development Trust, that the skill set uh, for rebuilding uh, destroyed heritage does ex exist in Kathmandu. Also in, uh, in relation to the organization that I happen to be associated with, but beyond that, that there are skill sets to do wood carving, to do brick laying of the kind that is required, of tile, um, tile making, of bronze lost wax, wax process and solid bronze uh, statuary, all kinds and filigree work and repose work etc. So that exists. challenge is that it now needs to be multiplied by 100. If you have one person, you need 100. If you have five uh, wood carvers, you need 500 because the demands are such. Um, I'll give you an example of what happened in Patan Darbar Square, which is some regard as one of the most explicitly preserved. You know, it did come down in 1934 and it came down again this time. But the, there was one temple in the 1934 earthquake that was not rebuilt. It, was, it had a Mughal style stucco structure put on it like a thumb, thumbtack and that was left. It was a temple to Vishashwar, that is Shiva. It was built in 1669 when Aurangzeb, the Mughal emperor, destroyed Kashi Vishwanath. The people of Patan said, oh, now what shall we do? We can't go to Banaras anymore to do to, to the Kashi Vishwanath, the Shiva temple there. So the then Prime Minister of Patan said, I will build it. So he built a three-tiered temple. The biggest, if you don't count the Taliju Bhavani Mandir within Patan Darbar, it was the biggest temple outside. He built it, it came down, it was built in 1670, it was consecrated in 1678, a large temple to Shiva. It came down in the 1934 earthquake. And we had just raised enough money, got UNESCO permission, and the woodwork was being done, one workshop in Bhumumati and two in Bhaktapur. And this was done by a, a group of individuals, not any organizations, just some individuals that came together. Just as we consecrated it with Satyamon Joshi as our patron, the, we did a Chema Puja and we consecrated it, and we started work two months ago. The earthquake came and other temples falling all around us. So, all I could say is that here we must do, redo this temple, rebuild it, in the best practices to be the example for the temples that have to be built. And as I suggested to you, there are examples. But it is not, I think monuments will be rebuilt one way or the other. It is the streetscapes that is important to also focus on because it is possible that the streetscape of Bungumati town, for example, the, the, some of the uh, the contributions you have made today is going to go to Bungumati. Bungumati is this lovely town which is also the home of Bungdeo, Machindrana, also known as uh, Avalokiteshwar. He is a uh, deity, uh, the indigenous deity Bungdeo, the Buddhistic deity Avalokiteshwar or Lokeshwar, and the Hinduistic deity Machindrana of the Goraknath sect. That is his hometown. He came from Assam, as religious mythology would have it. That village uh, was, was not even yet on the touristic map. 
it was preserved, it was waiting to be discovered. And uh, two months ago, I was in Bhagmati town talking about how do you convert your alleyways and lanes? How do you make it inviting like the old parts of, old cities of Europe? How do you bring people in? Because you have it all. And now most of them, most of the houses, 700 houses, if I remember, of about 1400 houses are down. So can we question, and this is, it then becomes a creative exercise to really build, not from the ashes, but from the dust. Because, thank God, there was no fires. It was after the cooking hour. So otherwise you would have fires as well. So we have to count our small mercies. So, could this be an opportunity? We didn't want this earthquake. It was handed to us. Now that we've got it, and we've gone over our personal tragedies, which of course will stay with us, can we see how we can do Bungamati in a way that it will retain its ancient flavor, yet it will also respond to the villagers' need now for new technology in the building. Can we, for example, somebody in government suggests, oh, now we need to make these roads wider because we got to send fire trucks to them. Then you have to tell them that you can have narrow fire trucks too. <laughs> if you have thought about that, you know. So there is, luckily I think in the beginning, a lot of people, because there's such populist pressures, people are making all kinds of claims and just even to satisfy their own souls and to satisfy media and, you know, to be seen to be doing something. We need to now settle down to a point where we can catch our breath, look to the future in all these areas, from housing to schooling to livelihood to heritage, and perhaps delve into the skill set that exists around the world and in Nepal. Two points I'd like to make. One is that something that I had suspected but was proven to me this time around, that Nepal is the country with the largest Perhaps, you would say, this is a rather amorphous terrain that I'm getting into. Nepal is the country, it seems to me, that has the largest per capita goodwill in the world. And I sense it, and which then makes me sad for other parts of the world which are visited by tragedy. The kind of sensibility that comes forth for Nepal. And I think it is not about Mount Everest, Sagarmata, Chomalongma. It's not even about high Tibetan. Uh, culture, etc. I think it's about the fact that people go there as trekkers, they interact with the people, and they sense the openness that Nepalis have towards each other and towards the outsider. That is something that is a result of Nepal being a country of micro-communities, where economic survival requires them being open to each other, and that gives an overall ethos. So it is not something genetic at all. It is something to do with our geography and our demographic nature that has made Nepal an interesting place which now when an earthquake comes we get so many people wanting and willing to help. Our only point that we have to remember is we want to make sure that that help comes over the long run. We may even, Nepal may even become an exemplary country visited by a disaster where we, as we rise from the dust, we are able to both take help from international organizations and individuals but also be able to demand probity in the kind of assistance that's given, be able to demand what kind of assistance we do require, and to get over any parochialism within Nepal, but also to demand, um, for, to begin with, money that is promised has got to be given. You, may, you need not have promised, but if you have, then we need to do an accounting to say if you followed through. I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about governments. As far as individuals are concerned, there was a major mistake done by the Nepal national. Uh, central bank by announcing three days after the earthquake you may not send money independently you have to send it to the Prime Minister's Relief Fund. Now I am personally a supporter of the Prime Minister's Disaster Relief Fund but I myself had to go and lobby together with others to say this is stupid. Nepal has such diverse variety of individual friendships around the world and only when you allow that friendship to activate itself in supporting the people of Nepal, will it go to the capillaries where it is needed. And each one will send it to somebody he or she knows. And that way you get to where the people will be needing it. Perhaps Nepal in that sense would and can do better than others. So looking to the future, what I feel is that 
One is, there is a world of interest in Nepal for many reasons, including trekking tourism and the nature of our demography. But there will be people who are experts in solar technology, micro hydro, road building, uh, building materials, new, new ways to use cement and mud, etc., etc. I mean, 100,000 areas of arenas where people will be willing to contribute. That is the world of friendship that Nepal is proud to have. Within Nepal, there was a new development that I would like to share with you, which is a very pleasant thing indeed, that, you know, the whole world of development activism has converted to development careers. So the large INGOs tend to now be more career-oriented placements for young people wanting to get into a career in development. So the kind of volunteerism, volunteer spirit has sort of gone away in most organizations and that is true around the world. Nepal is not an exception. But, but the cycle seems to be, at least in Nepal, in a way has come to an end in that this earthquake threw up many skilled and capable volunteers. I think this was something new that came up. That is something also new. And I will not say young, because in Nepal there is also this attempt to say, oh, the youth will do everything, and the youth is nowhere to be seen in most places, including among the political class, the young leaders. But unbeknownst came out that way, and suddenly, spontaneously, there are people active, doing the kind of things, going to the capitals, using a motorbike if you cannot get otherwise, frustrated with the government, battling the government, but not battling the government cynically. This is the difference from the Facebook postings and the various postings that you may have read and these people on the ground. What they were doing, and they were not only young, they were all ages, but mostly young. They were frustrated by the inability to get the tops out through customs, found, found it difficult to get money through, etc. But they found via media because they knew that there was no time to bemoan the inefficient state. To me, this is where I find uh, uh, a level of hope that there were people who would, were problem sol solvers as it was happening. And there were three or four staging grounds in Kathmandu where suddenly people congregated on their own. Now, what I would hope, and this is what I have written in an article in yesterday's Kathmandu Post, in my column yesterday, I would hope that among this category, not everyone, I would hope that they would be positively politicized. What do I mean by that? I mean, they've come to see the tragedy on the ground, they've gone to the villages, they've come to see the fecklessness in, in, in large parts of the government, of the state. They've come to see, the, in a way, the kind of militarization that has also gone on in the minds of people, the way the military seems to be in the forefront, whereas these are civilians active. They might have mulled over that aspect also. I mean, how do you do rescue? Do you always do it through the militaries. 18 countries sent their militaries to Nepal. The Americans sent like an invading force, the Austrians. The British were not able to get in their, um, their Chinooks, unfortunately. That is a story in its own right. As yet, not clear, but unfortunate. It seems the problem seems to be on the Nepal side. Um, but then the Israelis, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Singaporeans, the Bangladeshis, the Pakistanis, the Chinese, and helicopters from all over, flying over Nepali skies. People get to see that perhaps there's also some geopolitics involved in all the kind of assistance given. I feel that, and I should come to uh, closure here, here, I feel that this category, if it becomes positively politicized, by that I mean they get to understand the reality on the ground, they get to understand that cynicism does not help anyone, um, that you need to, uh, that politics everywhere is in a mess. And in Nepal, it's slightly in a more of a mess because we're coming out of a conflict situation and uh, a polarizing situation, a uh, situation where various regions are being pitted against each other by certain forces. Uh, and therefore, the politics is weak. While, but on the other hand, we are on a back, on a track back to democratic governance. But they will have noticed, we don't have local government. Perhaps a lot of the problems of the first few hours and days 
would have been solved if there had been local government. So why don't we have local government elections? They would have mulled over that. They would have mulled over if only we had political stability because there is a constitution, then maybe some of these issues, the, the government at the center would have more self-confidence to tackle internationals, to tackle local power forces, to tackle corrupt individuals in the country. So if we could perhaps have this positive politicization, I'm thinking that we may have turned a corner uh, utilizing an earthquake that we didn't want to maybe do better for our people uh, tomorrow. I'll end with one anecdote. I talked about Bungumati, that is a valley town. Let me now talk about a mountainside. The village of Atedana. Atedana is in the south beyond the valley river, but in the shadow of Kathmandu Valley, historically, not just in the last 50 years, but over the centuries. And it's in the plains shadow in the sense that once the planes started falling, flying in, you get to see all these rugged terrain and scattered and villages in obvious poverty, but nothing has reached them. A very sandy um, mountainside, and hence very vulnerable to earthquake. So Bhattedana has a central um, market. It's flattened. Only three buildings stand. The, the health post, the police post, and the school. Because they're all made in concrete beam. Mm. And so the people there are distraught because historically they have felt they are outside the mainstream, although they are so close to Kathmandu. From the hilltop you can see the lights of Kathmandu. Above you see, you know, 50, 50 aircraft flying every day. Yet, they are now feeling like, should we leave? Should we leave? <coughs> but how can we stay here? We should leave because everybody else is doing okay. But now we've been visited with an earthquake. The interesting thing is, for the people of Patedana, we have to find a way to convince them not to leave. Why? There is a 18 meter wide highway from Hetaura going up to Kathmandu through Patedana. That will, once it's fully made, be the probably the primary route into Kathmandu. So, this is where you should benefit, the people of Putin, number one. Number two, right down below there is a 6.5 megawatt hydropower, with, which will produce about three hydropower stations, which will produce about three megawatt all year round. So you will have electricity like the people of Kathmandu never had. Number three, up on the hill, a highly wooded hillside like Pulchoki, rich in bird life and fully wooded, because they are putting up a new radar station, they have built a lovely highway there. It will be one of the finest places to have uh, tourism lodges, especially if you can have, build them cooperatively, so that the village is. So here we have a situation where just when, the very year or two, when Bhatte Dada has this very sad, historically marginalized uh, village is about to see the future, they are being hit with an earthquake that makes them fee, see only darkness. So these are the kind of things I feel that we must uh, do something about and uh, perhaps take energy that is within Nepal and take energy that is outside Nepal to make Nepal what, it, what its history and its demography tells us it can be. We should make it happen. We didn't want this aspect, but we can use it. Thank you.
what we even don't know, and this is the point I would like to make, we just actually don't know what's happened to small shrines in each of the Bahas and Bahis in the courtyards. We actually don't know. Uh, uh, there are, that is something that's being studied right now uh, by, by quite a large number of people that are... That was take up to four and Uh, Bhaktapur, the five-story Nyatapala, stands tall. Patan, the five-story Kumbhesha, uh, stood through the first two earthquakes, because as far as I'm concerned, there were three earthquakes and many aftershocks. But people could say that it was one earthquake and many aftershocks. For me, for, for what it did to me while I was standing, it's three earthquakes. Um, Kumbhesha lost, survived the first, but lost it stopped in the last one. Um, the Krishna Mandir in Patan, Darbar Square, the first two stories are okay, the plinth is okay, but the top has moved. So it looks, to the untrained eye, it looks fine, but uh, it is severely weakened. But there are two large temples uh, next to Krishna Mandir, uh, each of them two-tiered temples, they are down. In Kathmandu, the two great temples, Maju Degal and the other one whose name I forget, uh, they are both rubble, and to the left, Kastak Mandal, after which Kathmandu is named. Um, there was the biggest tragedy of all, uh, because there was a, there was a, uh, that morning, there was a blood donation exercise, and the entire Kastak Mandal fell, and there were about 12 or 14 dead. You just, I mean, this is my last thing. You talked about the cement, and the one hand, where was that? Uh, Kathmandu there was one. Well. Pratap Mohan. Uh, what's your view about the people response that you know, at the governmental level, you know, there's been a lot of money, but how is that managed? Yeah, I, I didn't get around to it. I didn't mean to talk about it. Uh, firstly, I felt that politically, the political leaders in Nepali, the world would be Shir Shastra, the top post. And there's an article I wrote in Outlook in India where I challenged them because they disappeared from the scene for two full weeks. These individuals that we had had to listen to them and hear them and watch them continuously for 15 years, they disappeared poof, from the media scene. One is, of course, they may have been sagacious to say, okay, we're not needed at that time. But no, it is more that, the, because what I know from what I know of political science is that politi politicians love to take charge of crisis to make a name for themselves. So it will be very interesting for the political scientists to watch why did they disappear from the scene for two full weeks. My own sense, of course, is that um, I won't talk about the political cadre of any of the parties, but I can tell you that the political top posts, the Shir Shastra, have been extremely compromised because they came into a very cozy relationship with each other. It started with the Maoists proposing something called an all-party mechanism. And then in that, everybody gained, everybody had power, everybody shared. And then one person might be in power, tomorrow somebody else might be. But this Samyantra, this mechanism, uh, is the one that really took the decisions. <coughs> it was very non-democratic, but everybody was in the, in the game at the top post. So I think across the board, from the Maoists to the UML and the Congress, this sort of disappeared, number one. Number two, uh, the state, meaning the existing government rather, uh, show, saw very lackluster leadership by the Prime Minister. He was in Indonesia. He could have asked for a, a business trip to fly to Nepal. Instead, he came back in what you would call a leisurely fashion. There, were, there was the Prime Minister of Bhutan already having visited the Darbar Square when the Nepali Prime Minister visited two days or three days later. So this lack of ability to take charge, to me that was something, you may say that you know, governments function, the best government is where there is no hero, that everything functions properly. That could be one interpretation, but for me, I felt that under the circumstances you needed a personality out there and the Prime Minister was the right person. But he was just not up to the task of providing like a 
the kind of speeches you need to give, the kind of sensitivity you wanted to show in the speeches that you do. You may not deliver it well, but the wording in it must be one that shows sensitivity. To me, that was lacking. Um, as far as the state is concerned, as a whole, which includes the government, I think the state, um, if there is a need for us to reconsider all the criticism in social media and in mainstream media, internationally as well as locally, just because we will probably find that the, the correct positioning of the correct evaluation of the government will be somewhere in the middle, not the drastic, um, uh, what's the word, condemnation that they received, because the, there's a unit within behind the Home Ministry for National Disaster Operation Center, it's called NDOP or something like that, and it was it had met within two hours. It had already sent out notices and deployed the army and the security forces and the army and the uh, armed police and the police were out immediately. Uh, the roads were not allowed to be closed so the main highways remained open. The cell phone system came back on very quickly or actually was, did not even go off, off at all. Electricity, there was some assistance from India as well so the electricity was restored. So, if you look at the, the, the other stuff that did happen, the biggest tragedy, of course, was the inability to reach uh, food. Before food, the inability to reach people for rescue while there were still people alive under the rubble. Some of that, I think, had to do with government inefficiencies. Some of it had to do with the nature of our terror. Um, and then, uh, relief supplies. I. I am one of those who also was critiquing as it happened, but I'm myself saying that now, okay, maybe we also have to look at, we want to make sure that our government is as good for itself for its people. But there is some advantage to compare it to see how did it happen in Ache, how did it happen in Fukushima, how did it happen in Kashmir, how did it happen in Haiti. Everybody tends to talk about Haiti. And uh, I wish our Prime Minister doesn't say we don't want to be like Haiti, because for a country where we sent cholera too, we got to be a little more sensitive um, about, uh, you know, the, the Nepali forces probably had a role in the spread of cholera in Haiti, uh, peacekeeping forces. So, but regardless, perhaps if a comparative study would show, as one British uh, disaster expert who came along to Kathmandu to look at the Nepali disaster response said that he found that, uh, on the whole, um, Nepal's, the Nepali state's response was not at all as bad as it was painted, uh, number one. Number two, and I asked him, well, how does he, what is his, uh, what is the criteria on which he makes that judgment? He says, the Nepali government managed to retain control of the process. That is what his point was now. I, I think this, the jury is still out of this. So, this one. Because uh, the Prime Minister's Relief Fund is, firstly, uh, Nepal has a democratic government. It is a country that is weakened through 10 years of war and 8 years of dysfunction due to um, a situation created by the very people in the war. This is now, we get into slightly political terrain, so I'll back off from that. And I will just say this much that Nepal is a country that uh, even went into a year and a half of a technocratic, non-democratic, unelected government. Then in November 2013, an election was held. And now we're limping back towards quote-unquote normalcy. So firstly, my defense of, the, uh, of, that, um, uh, of the fund is that it is a fund in the name of a democratic government and a democratic prime minister, number one. Number two, how corrupt uh, is the Nepali government? How corrupt are the, are the individuals in the government? It's a relative thing. I think they are quite corrupt, uh, but not this particular entity, which is the Prime Minister's Fund. It is um, audited by the Auditor General of Nepal to begin with. So, and Nepal does have institutions. People tend to forget that, that Nepal actually has institutions that have proved the test in so many arenas. If you think about our Supreme Court, 
for example. The human rights jurisprudence in Nepal is one of the best in South Asia. But we don't get credit for it because people don't read the Supreme Court judgment because they are in Nepal. Every other Supreme Court judgment in South Asia is in English. So, just by way of making a defense that the state of Nepal is weakened, it is towards democratization, its government is democratic, and this particular um, Prime Minister's fund is uh, uh, run, the coordinator is the head of the National Planning Commission. And he is regarded by one and all as a man of probity who will not stand it being misused. And finally, it is audited by the Auditor General of Nepal. So, that is my defense that when people say we want to help Nepal, I say you could consider the Prime Minister's fund. To, at the very least, I don't think uh, there is a monopoly on corruption that sticks only to the government of Nepal. The, if you look at the INGOs, if you hear stories of the UN agencies in Nepal, you, and some INGOs, I mean, I will not tar everything, but all I'm saying is, and the NGOs, nobody has a monopoly, and so the Nepali government should be seen in that context in a slightly better light. That having been said, I do feel that the Prime Minister's fund, disaster relief fund, should not be a monopoly result for funding from individuals worldwide. That was the intent, and that is what we need to fight, and we, we did it, but I can tell you it was a very sad moment for people like me. We said, there's such a small window when people want to give. And at that very window, you said you can't give it, you give it to the Prime Minister's Fund. And nobody, I, mean, I might trust the Prime Minister's Fund, but I can't convince the world. And so, I think we lost many millions of dollars. I don't know how many, tens of or millions, I don't know, but we lost lots of money there. Just because for four days, everything got locked in. And even today, people are confused. Really, can you send, can you not send that individually? But luckily, as far as the rules are concerned, what they have is, uh, in order to send money, one is you can now, as individuals, you need not send it to the Prime Minister's Fund, you can send it to anybody who has a pre-existing account prior to April 25. What is, that is April 25, 2015. No, an NGO, well, it depends on who you want to send it to, because NGO would be a better account. Because individually, I think uh, there too, it's not a problem, but I don't think most people will send an individual account. Because individual accounts are between friends, so that's also not a problem. But if you want to send in large amounts, and what you want to do is to, the, the, the stricture that the government has is, an account after 25 April would mean that these are corporate divers that are trying to milk. So the intention was very good, but the way they applied it was wrong, and now they're backed out of it. So now this is the rule. The other rule is that, there is, you are required to get prior approval for a donor fund from the Social Welfare Council, which is the repository. But that has been loosened also. But now, you only, for the next two months, you only need...